All right, I will begin with a word of prayer. Dearly Father, we uh, thank you for this day again. I thank you for this class and these students. Just ask that you just guide our, guide our steps today. Help us to understand what we need to understand about eigenvectors and spectral theorem and all these things, Lord. In your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. So I just started by writing the uh, theorem we proved. Well, maybe proved is too strong a word, but uh, we, we thought about the proof of it last time. Um, namely that if you have a bounded operator and um, its, its norm is less than the, uh, you know, the modulus of a particular complex number, then the resolvent, um, you know, a minus lambda i inverse is a bounded operator and you can actually find it by this series of powers of a appropriately weighted by powers of lambda. The corollary to that is this, is that if you have a bounded operator, then this, this, this R of A, Audric, is the, um, it's the so-called spectral radius. Um, so like, um, so if I, man, I don't want to write all that out again. At the start of section 4.9, he defines, you know, eigenvalue, and then he defines, um, the um, oh come on where'd you go? Yeah, I guess it's on on page one eighty eight, right? So he he defines the uh, uh, yeah that's the that is the resolvent of a with respect to lambda, of course, and um, so yeah the the complement um, so rho of a basically rho of a um, rho of A is equal to lambda in the complexes such that, you know, A lambda exists, <laughs> yeah. So these are called the regular values, quote unquote regular values, and then sigma of A is the complement of that, I believe. C minus rho of A, isn't it right? Complement of rho of A C. Yeah, the complement. And that's called the spectrum of A. That's denoted sigma of A. And then the spectral radius, R of A, is equal to the supremum of, you know, the absolute value of lambda such that lambda is in the uh, spectrum of A. So this is so-called spectral radius. So um, in the case of a finite dimensional operator, Right? Um, well, in the case of a finite dimensional operator, all of this stuff becomes a little bit easier, you know, because if you're talking about an operator in finite dimensions, you're talking about, well, you have a, an equation, right? The characteristic equation, the solution set to that are your eigenvalues, right? And because it's an nth order polynomial equation over the complexes, there exist n possibly repeated complex solutions. And so the, um, the spectral radius is literally just the length of the maximum eigenvalue in the complex plane. So it's just, it's just that, right? So it, it really does mean spectral radius if you're talking about a finite dimensional operator where you have you know, a list of n eigenvalues, you just plot them in the complex plane. The one that's the furthest from the origin defines the spectral radius. So within the, we know within the disk of the origin, um, of that, that spectral radius, all of your eigenvalues for the whole operator are in there. Um, so there's that. But of course, he's, you know, this is for infinite, this, some of these things are for infinite dimensional spaces, so he isn't saying those things because they're not, you know, appropriate to say here. Um, but it's assumed that we already talked about eigenvalues in the finite dimensional context before this, right? So, um, all right. Um, is that corollary clear from the theorem? Hmm. I need to turn my volume up. I've made you too quiet today, Audric. I'll fix it. 
Oh, no, no, it's just my computer's the volume was down. It's all good. Um, goodness, I don't know. I don't see it right offhand. Uh, I mean, it's supposedly a corollary to that theorem, so it shouldn't be hard. You know? So R of A is the supremum of the... I guess the thing that makes this a little bit tricky is... how. Wait a minute, how is that... <laughs> but this is, this is about the lambda for which this stuff doesn't happen. How's that work? <laughs> um, ah. Hmm. Oh. Oh, 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 okay, maybe, uh, yeah, I think you got, you got something there, let's try, good point, good point, so if, if we had this was less than that, right, for some lambda, if that was, if that was the case for some lambda, then that, Oh, no, the theorem is more carefully stated that if A is a bounded linear operator and, and the norm of A is less than lambda, then the resolvent um, is a bounded operator. And, uh, so, so I guess I kind of have, I mean, I'm missing an if. No, I, yeah, sorry. That's but, um, so the, no, that's relevant. So if this is the case, then that exists, right? which then means that lambda is not in sigma. Yeah. So if this was the case, that would imply that that lambda is not an element of the um, sigma of A, because it would then be in the, um, the resolvent of A, right? Oh right, right. But the to, to but to figure out the spectral radius, we have to think about the. The supremum of the lambda is not. Right. So in principle, you think about all possible lambdas for the spectral radius, right? But you quickly learn that the um, spectral radius cannot be larger than the uh, the norm because if the spectral radius was larger than the norm, then that would imply that that <laughs> I mean. It, Some in if, if R of A was larger than this, then that would imply that there's a point in the, in the spectrum which is not in the spectrum because if there's a point in this, you know, if there's a point in sigma of A which, is, which has norm larger, which is larger than the norm of A, then that lambda shouldn't be in there because the theorem says that it's not an element. I mean, so that forces the radius to be, at most, the um, the norm of A. Oh, that's the theorem. That's the corollary. Okay, so all right. So next, the next theorem is that if T is an invertible, so that that that's useful because sometimes you can calculate the 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 norm. Um, of an operator, and then that gives you a sense of where you're looking. If you're looking for eigenvalues, then you know where to look. So you're looking for numbers less than that, that magnitude. Okay. Anyway. Um, so that, that could at times be useful in, you know, sorting through, is it, is it an eigenvalue, is it not, whatever. Um, T invertible operator in a vector space E, A is an operator on E, then A and T, A, T inverse have the same eigenvalues. 
So, um, me. Yeah, so this is, let's see, here's the proof of it. So let lambda be eigenvalue. So the, the proof here, I think, is pretty much the same as the finite dimensional one, but I'll do it. Let be an eigenvalue of A. Then, right, there exists u not equal to zero, such that what? Such that A, um, a u equals to lambda u, right? Then T u is not equal to zero, right? Why? Mm. My nose is itchy all of a sudden. The eraser dust is after me, I think. Right, t is invertible, so it sends 0 to 0, and that's all that it sends to 0. So t of u is not equal to 0. Um, let's see here. Then, if we look at t a t inverse acting on t u, what do we get? We get t a acting on u which is t lambda u, which is lambda t u, which shows you what? t u, right, is an eigenvector with eigenvalue lambda for t a t inverse. So that shows you that if lambda is an eigenvalue of A, then it's an eigenvalue of TAT inverse. And a, a pretty similar argument can be given for the reverse, right? So if, um, let's suppose TAT inverse V is equal to lambda V, right? then um, what I kind of expect then is, so let's see, let's, let's, let's see how it worked before. In the previous argument, we, we had u as an eigenvector for a, and what happened? We had t u as an eigenvector for t a t inverse, right? So if it works the same way in the other part of the proof, we should expect that t inverse v is an eigenvector of f a. We suspect T inverse V is eigenvector of A. Let's try it out. So if we do A times T inverse V, right? We can rewrite that as um, yeah, yeah, T inverse T A T inverse V just putting in a pair of T and T inverse there but then that simplifies to T inverse times lambda V which is lambda inverse lambda times T inverse V which shows as we thought that T inverse V is an eigenvector of A with eigenvalue lambda. So another way to say this is similarity transformations don't change the, uh, the eigenvalues. All right, so here um, A and T A T inverse, these, these operators are related by a similarity transformation. If we conjugate by an invertible operator like this, this is a similarity transformation. Um, I'm not certain the language similarity transformation is used in the infinite dimensional context, but that's what we say in finite dimensional linear algebra, right? The matrices for such operators are similar, right? So the big theorem of finite dimensional linear algebra is you give me any matrix, right? It is similar to the Jordan form of the matrix. In other words, I can, you give me any matrix A, 
I can do a similarity transformation of that matrix to a matrix which is called the Jordan form of A if we're working over the complexes. Now if we're working over the reals, you give me any matrix A, I can do a similarity transformation which takes it to the real Jordan form. Um, in my humble opinion, every finite dimensional linear algebra course should get to this point. But the spirit is willing, but the students are weak. No, I'm sorry. The flesh. It's the flesh. Don't blame the students. Um, anyway, so there's that. The next theorem, all eigenvalues of a self-adjoint operator in a Hilbert space are real. Okay, so let's, let's work this out. So what does it mean for, so we have what, T equals to T adjoint, right? T equals to T adjoint. And we're going to look at, um, let me erase this mumbo jumbo here. Am I okay, Audrey? Yeah, um, are you using one board? Or no, you got two. I got, yeah, we're back, we're back. We're living the high life today. We got two boards. Ooh, why did I do that? Oh, yuck, I've smudged it. Look at it, it's hideous. All right. What does what does Brandon typically do? Oh yes. Yeah, I he saves an inordinate amount of time not caring about that though. But anyway, um. Uh, yeah, it bothers me. It always has bothered me, especially when I was a student. So okay, so we want to assume that we have an eigenvalue. Right? So in other words, there exists a u not equal to zero such that tu is lambda u. All right? So sometimes we don't write the parentheses. All right? But it is t acting on u equal to lambda u. It could be a matrix also, right? Anyway, okay. We're, I'm thinking of t as an operator. Though. All right, so then we do is we look at um, the inner product of tu. Uh, man, what do we do? Not quite sure. Let me check. Okay, okay, so let me start out in the right right spot here. So he does lambda with UU. <laughs> okay, so lambda UU is a this 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 will be the secret sauce. If we look at this, everything magic will happen that we want to see. Alright, so lambda UU. Alright, so then proper inner product. So I guess we're on a Hilbert space, right? Oh yeah, Hilbert space. <laughs> There's a clue. So um, bring in the lambda. Lambda u u, right? Properties of inner product, but lambda u is assumed to be t u. We're looking at the eigenvector, so we got inner product t u u, right? But it's equal to the adjoint. If we shift it over, right? And poor planning on my part. I should have worked over. So, all right, T, and then what, you say? Oh, so it's, it is, yeah, what you just said was good. So then, since it's self-adjoint, right, we have T star is equal to T, and that gives us what? U T U, right? Which is U lambda U, which then by the sesquilinearity is lambda bar, lambda conjugate U U. Therefore, right, therefore lambda is equal to lambda bar, which is to say that the eigenvalue is real. So that's cool. Um, other theorems which I'll talk about but not prove. Yeah? So 
let's see here in yeah that's that is why we want a Hermitian operator so like self adjoint translates to Hermitian in physics and if our operator is Hermitian then this eigenvalues are real and that's what you want because the eigenvalues are what we observe in experiments right so um, well there you go that's that's the uh, these are the things we tell ourselves in physics anyway, all right. So um, you might wonder then, you know, well, why can't you measure something complex? Uh, well, it's, you're doing a measurement, it has to be real. It's like, um, yeah, but why couldn't you have a mathematical model of something where the uh, observational was complex and you uh, measure that in some kind of meaningful way? Well, we measure real things, like, okay. So like you don't measure like vectors in the plane then because a complex number describes a vector in the plane. Why can't we measure complex things? I can measure a, a, a direction and a magnitude. That's a complex number. We measure complex numbers all the time. <laughs> so, I don't know. But it is a choice that we insist on real quantities being, like physical observer, ver, observables being real. That's a, a convention of physics really, I think. But it, it, is, it is a convention, I mean, because you could, in principle, think of other ways of writing physical laws that used the mathematics we have in a different way. I mean, there's a guy who wrote a whole book of quantum mechanics using quaternions. Um, I haven't seen that book, but Dr. Fulp used to talk about it sometimes. Anyway, um, a bounded self-adjoint operator in Hilbert space, if that's the case, then the spectral radius is equal to the, uh, the norm of the operator. That's kind of neat. Yeah, yeah. So then, then it's real, it's apparently it, that inequality becomes, a, becomes an equality. It's attained actually, yeah. Well, I guess you don't actually have to have an eigenvalue which reaches it, but you at least have to have a sequence of eigenvalues which takes the spectral radius as its limit, right? Because we are, this, I erased it, but the, the, the spectral radius is defined in terms of a supremum. So there's a little bit of, a little bit of wiggle room there. Um, and then the next theorem is all eigenvalues of a positive operator are non-negative. All eigenvalues of a strictly positive operator are positive. So we, we haven't gone into too much detail in this, this lecture series, right, on what, that's, what that means. But there's, if you want to, you can dig into that section, right, like I talked about. Now here, this one's interesting. All eigenvalues of a unitary operator on a Hilbert space are unimodular. All right, so let's, let's work that out. So what does it mean to be a, a unitary operator on a Hilbert space? So um, that meant that if you have u with x and u with y, you get xy. Is that how he defined unitary? That's how I define unitary. Oh, so he he's defined it in terms of you need that u u u star is equal to the identity. Yes. So that is. That is equivalent to what I've written, because certainly if that's if this is true, that implies this. Because if I move if I move that over, then I have well, you also you you also have u star u is equal to i. You get both, right? If you get one, you get the other, because you can take the adjoint of the equation, and the adjoint of the identity is the identity. So with this, if we have an eigenvalue, right? So if ux is equal to lambda x, right? Then if you look at it, ux uy is lambda x lambda y, right? This is all equal to xy. But then by the sesquilinearity, we get lambda lambda bar. XY, 
but we assumed x and y were eigenvectors here, so they're non-zero. You know, I, I don't need x, y here. I'm a dummy. What should I have done? <clears throat> this is an easy. Should I have done an x and y, Audric? What should I have done here? I should have done x, x, right? See that? No, no, no. The inner, pro the inner product of x with x is the length of x squared. And since x is non-zero, that's non-zero. The point of this is that 1 is equal to lambda bar lambda, which is to say, of course, that the modulus of lambda is equal to 1, which is what we're trying to prove. So the, so the eigenvalues of a unitary operator have to have unit modulus. They're somewhere on the unit circle in the complex plane. In the case of a, in, in, when, the, when we look at this theory in the real context, right, the unitary operators become orthogonal operators. And this condition reduces to what, what, is, what are the eigenvalues that are real? So an orthogonal operator is also, um, well, is it self adjoint? Oof. I guess no, that's not true. An orthogonal operator doesn't have to be um, symmetric. My bad. But um, if, we, if we do look at an orthogonal operator, we do have to have that the, um, its eigenvalues have to be of unit modulus. So um, I should be careful. So uh, well, this is the, this is the tricky thing. Um, can I erase? I think I erased most of this. Let me say a couple things about just finite dimensional linear algebra here because I think it's good for both of you to hear it because I have a strong suspicion that maybe you didn't quite hear this in your previous course. So hear it from me now. So if we think about rotations, the, the discussion of rotations and um, eigenvectors is an important discussion, right? So if you have a rotation, what is an eigenvector for a rotation? So let's see here. Like, for example, So first of all, let's do n equals to 2. What's an arbitrary, what's that? What? Oh, oh, oh. Thanks, a little more. Yep. OK. So the rotation um, in, in, in two dimensions, um, a rotation looks like this. I mean, you could put the minus on whichever one or the other you want to, OK? But this is a rotation, right? In other words, you, you can solve r transpose r equals to i with determinant of r equals to 1. This defines SO 2 r. These are the rotations of the plane, OK? So what are the eigenvalues of this? Did you ever look at this? It was a while ago, right? So think about this. So we're asking, you know, um, r times v equals to like lambda v for v not equal to 0. In other words, we've got, you know, lambda i minus, well, yeah, lambda i minus r times v equals to 0. So what we need is the determinant to be 0. So that's the determinant of lambda minus cosine minus sine sine lambda minus cosine. And so what that gives us is lambda minus cosine theta 
squared plus sine squared theta equal to zero. That's our eigen. That's our characteristic equation, right? What are the what are the, what are the solutions? So we get lambda is equal to plus or minus, you know, cosine theta. I should say we get my bad. We cosine theta plus or minus i sine theta. In other words, e to the plus or minus i theta. These are your your eigenvalues. Now, I say these are your eigenvalues, but this totally depends on context, right? Because if we're doing real linear algebra, we don't allow complex eigenvalues. So the typical statement would be there are no eigenvalues unless what? Theta is zero or pi. Theta is zero or pi, right. Right. So only, and that's the context, that context, the rotation is the identity operator or the uh, minus the identity, right? So another way to say this is there is no eigenvector. So if, if, um, if theta is not equal to n pi, right? for some integer n, right? Um, there does not exist a real eigenvector for r. And if you just stop and think about that, that makes so much sense because picture, picture it. What, what goes on for a rotation? What does it do? What is this rotation? What's the picture? You know, you start out with, with V like this, right? Where is RV? Like RV is here or whatever, right? I mean, it should have the same length, right? But you're rotating it, right? And so is it, is it possible for that to be a scalar multiple of V? Of course not, unless your angle is zero or pi. So yeah, I mean, we can do all this fancy schmancy math, but it was obvious from the beginning, if you just think about geometry and the meaning of vector, vectors, right? It's obvious that there's no eigenvector here for any interesting angles, yeah. The fascinating thing is that it, it's, this is n equals two. What, what happens in n equals three? What happens for n equals 3? Uh, you should get a, you should get like two rotations, like, like instead of being rotating on the first plane, you should like get like a whole like curl type deal going on. A curl type deal going on? Um, maybe. Oh, okay, yeah, so, oh, okay, so you're, you're like, maybe start with an example, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like this one, so take what we already had, right? And just put a one here, right? So this is a rotation about the z-axis. So if you, if you want to, you know, draw a picture of this, what's going on? If I take my vector v, right, then I, I rotate it, you know, let's say over to here. Let me foolishly attempt a picture here. So what's going on is there's, you know, like the shadow of V down here, right? And then there's the shadow of RV over here. All right. And that 
is the the angle right that I'm talking about is it's it's like this. That's where theta is in this picture. And so really, the only part of the vector which is you know okay, so how can I say this? Um, part of the vector is fixed, right? Like you can break v into two pieces, right? It's like v is equal to, you know, v1, v2, comma zero, right? Plus, you know, well, from a lack of board space, v3, z hat. <laughs> okay. So the, 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 the vertical piece of the vector stays put, right? It's just the, the horizontal piece which is, which is rotating. So what I'm saying is that the, you know, the third component of RV, RV3 is equal to V3, you know, which is manifest in this formula as well, you know, because you multiply by E3, you get, all right. So what does this all mean? So geometrically, you can already see what the eigenvectors are. What are the eigenvectors? So we want, you know, R times, let's say, U equals to lambda times U again. What should I, what's my eigenvector? You might have already told me, Audric. What? So, oh, so here's, here's some additional things we know. Some additional things we know. This is a rotation, which is, by the way, unitary. So um, the eigenvalue has to be of, of unit modulus, all right? And there are other things that are known, like the, um, the product of all the eigenvalues has to be equal to the determinant. And the sum of the eigenvalues, right, has to be equal to the trace. These things can be proved from the theory of Jordan forms most elegantly. They're obviously true for diagonalizable operators. Um, so the determinant is the product of the eigenvalues. No, it's not, it's not you, it's, it's the light point, sorry. Uh, let's see here. Like the light's hitting the board at such an angle that it gets very bright. Mm. Let me try something. Let me try something. Yeah, I mean, no, I got, I've got a, another thing to use here. Do, 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 do. <laughs> How's that? Okay. I'm a little close, but that's fine. I can read, I can read the board very well. Now. What are you, are you worried about something? Yeah, it's stable. Oh, it's okay. It's no, it, it's, it's, it's stable. I, I... <laughs> it's a little sketchy. <laughs> I mean, if it's stable, it's fine. Nice. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> So, well, the, the thing is, the determinant of R is one, all right? So, and, and if we allow, so let's allow for complex eigenvalues for the sake of interesting discussion. So we have is lambda one, lambda two, lambda three has to be equal to one. Oh, 
Well, it's, it's, there's something more easy and geometric to see here, like already from the picture, like what is an eigenvector for this rotation around the z-axis? How, how about any vector along the z-axis? See, I, so yeah, I mean, if I just have like, you know, e, RE3, yeah. I get to E3, right? So that's an eigenvector with eigenvalue 1. So we have, you know, basically R, um, let's say RU is equal to U for U equal to, um, zero, zero, you know, whatever, C. What are, what are the other eigenvectors for this rotation? Well, you see, so if you start thinking about it, it's, it, starts to, it starts to be obvious that there can't be another real eigenvalue for this, for this transformation, right? Because just picture it, right? Like just picture it, what's happening. It's rotating around, right? It's not, it's only that, that perpendicular, you know, parallel to the z-axis part of the vector that it's not moving. And for it to be an eigenvector, it has to be like a rescaling, right? So it pretty much forces the other two eigenvalues to be complex. And more than that, because their product is real, it means that the other two eigenvalues have to be conjugate. But there's more, see, because the trace of this matrix is what? So what's the trace of this R? The trace of R is, we've got two, two, two cosine theta plus one, right? And that's supposed to be equal to lambda one plus lambda two plus lambda three, right? But we know that lambda one is one because of this. So this tells us that two cosine theta has to be equal to the sum of the two, the last two eigenvalues. But on the other hand, um, well, on the other hand, the characteristic equation is what? It's, you know, lambda minus cosine theta. I mean, for this, this example is kind of dumb. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm making this, this seem less complicated than it is because I'm working for a specific example. I mean, once I write the characteristic equation for the given matrix, it's a little bit silly. Let's see. I'm sorry. You're fine. So like, yeah. See, Well, I mean, well, what you, <laughs> what you have is lambda is equal to cosine theta plus or minus I sine theta from this being zero, or you have lambda equals to one. So these are the ones that have called lambda two and lambda three. When you add them, you get two cosine, th you get two cosine theta and you got the one. So the, 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 the thing that makes this problem more challenging is if I don't give you the formula for R. All right, to make this problem more interesting, we should just w look at R in the wild, so to speak, right? So like divorce yourself from this particular example and just think about all you're given is that R transpose R is equal to the identity and the determinant of R is equal to one, right? So that's all the information you have about a rotation in three dimensions in the abstract, okay? You can prove that there exists an eigenvector of eigenvalue one for such a mapping. Wait, but isn't this just, isn't this just like O and R or O and C? Well, yeah, I mean this, yeah, indeed, this means R is an element of what I call SO. Um, in our current context, three R, okay? So it's, 
it's, it's been a minute since I've worked through this problem, but um, as I recall, here's the logic that you do. First of all, you prove that there exists an eigenvector with eigenvalue 1. Okay. Once you do that, you pick that as the third element of your basis and extend it. See, the thing is, if, if it's a rotation with, uh, if you, basically then you, you can, um, in principle, choose a system of coordinates which then puts the matrix into that form. And then you can, well, anyway, let me see here. Let me, let me try to behave. How would we prove that this has an eigenvector with eigenvalue 1? Sorry, I'm trying to do homework with you guys today. <laughs> um, Oh man, I am rusty. How does that go? I mean, we still, we, we know some general things, like we know that the product of the eigenvalues is one. All right. Um, we also know that our transpose is equal to our inverse. That's, I mean, whatever that is. Um, Oh, 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 we know, we still know that the, um, do, 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 do. all right, um, so let's think about this, lambda 1 times lambda 2 times lambda 3 is equal to 1, right? How can that happen? Now we're allowing the... Right, we're allowing the possibility that these are complex, right? But, um, so if, um, so they, they you, you have to, you either have to have both of them are minus one, right? So you could have like one times minus one times minus one, right? Or you could have one times lambda times lambda bar. Or, of course, you could also have what? 1, 1, 1. I mean, that's also possible. So as I recall, the argument has to sort through these special cases. So the case, what does it mean if all your eigenvalues are 1? What matrix are we talking about? If all your eigenvalues are 1, wouldn't that just be like reflections? No, no, easier than the reflections. Okay, so fun question. I have the matrix 10, 17, 20, zeros elsewhere. What are the eigenvalues? Just 10, 17, right, the, these are the eigenvalues. Yeah. So conversely, if my eigenvalues are 1, 1, 1, I'm talking about, oh, the <laughs> I'm talking about the identity matrix, right? Yeah. What's, what's an eigenvector for the identity matrix? It, well, eigenvector has to be a vector, though. What's the eigenvector? Eigenvector. What's an eigenvector for the identity What's matrix? Any, like, E1, E2, E3. E1, E2, E3. What do you think? E3. Audrey thinks E3. And the answer is any non-zero, oh. any non-zero vector, right? <laughs> any non-zero vector has I V equals to V again, right? And 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 if V is non-zero, it's an eigenvector. Um, okay, if you're um, our book right now, if you're any vector, you're an eigenvector for. Anyway, so um, stupid, right? But um, okay, so you want to rule. So suppose we're not in that case, all right? And um, let's see here. What if you have two of the eigenvalues are minus one? See, if two of the eigenvalues are minus one, that forces the third one to be one, right? And what matrix are we talking about then? We're talking about yeah, we're talking about minus one, minus one, one, right? Mm -hmm. 
which is not coincidentally the exceptional case. One of the exceptional cases is in our original our, our n equals 2 case, right? That's pi. That's the angle pi. Yeah. So we, we'd like to think, so we'd like to assume, right? Assume that you're not in cases in either this case or that case, right? That forces us to be in this case right here. So that that proves that proves that one of the eigenvalues is one. The the key idea here being that the product of the eigenvalues has to be one. That's what's that's what you know. If if one of the eigen and so if one of the eigenvalues is one. Um, Let's see here. Why? How do I know that? It, well, how do I know it can't be like two and a half? What rules that out? Like, why can't why can't I have eigenvalue one half and eigenvalue um, two? There's a reason for that. Uh, our, our, we have to have one, one, right? Yeah. So. Um, yeah. Exactly. This theorem is what is what does it. Yeah. You can derive this theorem in the real case pretty easily, right? If you have, if you have r um, v equals to lambda v, right? Multiply by r transpose. What do you get? And then I guess um, the thing is, the, ugh, good grief. Um, oh man, I'm sorry guys, let me stop wasting your time. I'm spinning my wheels here. We should just go, we've already done it here. Why, why am I doing it again? Good grief, dummy. So anyway, just to get back to the logic here. So, you know, the, the product of the eigenvalues is one. You also have a proof that the, um, the complex modulus of each, so if we ex basically think about extending this operator to complex three space, okay? You extend the operator to complex three space, so there you can apply this theorem, because on complex three space, an orthogonal operator is a genuine unitary operator on C3. As such, this theorem applies. As such, all the eigenvalues of the complexification of the rotation operator have modulus one. And so that's why I'm not allowed, like, I have to put lambda and lambda conjugate here because I have a product of complex numbers which is equal to one. As I have said, we're already in the case that one of them is one. That forces the other two, the other two have to be conjugates. There's no way you can have a product of two complex numbers equal to one and not have them be, they have to either be, both be real, but that's already been ruled out. If they're both real, that means they're either one, one or minus one, minus one. We already threw out those cases. So they have to be genuinely complex. And those being genuinely complex is tantamount to, um, well, that's, that's tantamount to those not corresponding to real eigenvectors for the underlying map, just like in the other case. But, but more to the point, um, more to the point, since one is an eigenvalue, then you can argue there exists an eigenvector, which means that there exists an axis to which this can be understood as a rotation. What all this is proving, if you go through it carefully, is that given any rotation, any matrix satisfying these conditions, they are indeed a rotation matrix. There exists an axis, which is an eigenvector with eigenvalue one, and the plane which takes that axis as a perpendicular is full of vectors which are rotated. By what angle are they rotated? That's the neat thing. Because you can choose coordinates, which makes the, uh, the matrix look like that, it means that the trace of the rotation matrix is still twice the angle by which it rotates plus one. See, this formula is transferable in the abstract, even when it doesn't look like that. Yeah, so you can you could figure out what the angle of the rotation is by if the so in three in three dimensions, in three dimensions the uh, trace is twice the cosine of the angle by which it's rotating plus one. 
So, of course, this, this formula is true, obviously, for my example, right? But it turns out it's generally true. And you could use that, like if you're given an arbitrary three-dimensional uh, three rotation and ask what, by what angle it's rotating, this is like a quick way to calculate it. If I was a person making graduate qualifying exams for linear algebra, this is the kind of thing you'd find on my qual. <laughs> I, I test on this in my linear class. But. Of course, they have had homework on it by the time it hits them, you know, but. But you guys probably did not see that in your linear algebra, right? Yeah, that's fine. That's fine, too. Um, okay, so what's left here? Um, oh, let me, Audrey, I'm going to have to lower you because you're making me nervous. <laughs> That's fine. When you see the video, you'll see why. <laughs> Oh, um, we're, we're almost done, like 10, 10 minutes, probably 10 minutes, not much longer. Um, all right, so, okay, I'll try to be quick. So, um, let's see here. So up here at the top, we have eigenvectors corresponding to distinct eigenvalues of self-joint op or unitary operator Hilbert space or orthogonal. Um, um, hmm. How is that proved? I feel like the proof of that is not too, um, not too difficult. It's on the bottom of page 191. So that's probably a calculation worth a minute of our time. Sorry guys, I think I have, um, I had a plan <laughs> to get further today, and I think I've sabotaged my plan with showing you lin finite dimensional linear algebra stuff. Um, but I, I have no regrets because I think it serves both of you to see those things. So um, anyway, let's see here. All right, so we want to say AU1 equals to lambda 1 U1. AU2 equals to lambda 2 U2. Distinct eigenvalues means lambda 1 is not equal to lambda 2. All right. And then what you want to do is look at lambda 1 times the inner product of u1 and u2. All right. So you bring in that lambda. And what's that, what's that, what's that get you? Yeah, so the exact... So, yeah, this is AU1, U2. And then we can bring that over to the adjoint. If it's, and we'll, let's focus on the self adjoint proof since our time is limited here, right? So if A is self adjoint, that's equal to A. So that's a, AU2, right? But by definition, that's what? Yeah, lambda u2. So that's lambda conjugate u1, u2, right? But we're assuming self adjoint. And we proved just a second ago that the eigenvalue is real. And that's supposed to be 2, right? 2. So we have lambda 2 u1, u2. So what's that say? But Lambda 1 is not equal to lambda 2, right? So how can you have such an equation be true? What is that force? Uh, that force is inner product of u1 and u2 to be 0, and since they're considered Right, that, exactly. That force is the inner product of u1 and u2 to be 0. And so, and I think a similar argument is possible in the unitary case, right? So, so that's a the theorem. If A is compact self-adjoint on a Hilbert space H, then there exists W's such that the norm of W is 1 and the 